Hello and welcome back to the Rust beginner tutorial on coding in crypto. And here we're going to be talking about structs. So structs are a way in Rust to represent an object. So they're very similar to classes. You can define attributes of a struct. You can define methods, um, which are just like functions that are part of that object. And there's a lot that you can do with these kind of data types. So obviously super, super important for any kind of object oriented programming. So the way that you define a struct is you just use the struct keyword and we're going to just call this one user and we're going to add some attributes. So when you add an attribute, you're going to have to provide the data type. So we're going to go with username, email. Those are both going to be strings. And then I guess we'll just count like the number of times somebody signed in and we'll determine if they are active with a Boolean. Cool. So that right there is how you define a struct. Now, if you want to use it, you have to initialize it and you have to actually initialize it into some kind of variable or, you know, as part of an operation or what have you. So we're just going to initialize it as a variable. So we're going to say let user one equal user curly braces. And now we're going to determine each of those attributes. So let's set the email to, I don't know, like someone at example.com. We'll set the username to some username, one, two, three. And as you can see, it doesn't matter the order, right? Like we started with username and then we went to email. Like you don't have to determine the order or follow that order. You can just, since you're using the keywords of the attributes, it doesn't really matter. Active, we're gonna say true. And how many times did they sign in? Uh, I don't know, once. And now this user one is of type user and it's gonna have all these attributes that we presented here. Cool. Nice. Um, one neat function with structs is if you wanted to initialize it, let's just say uh, initialize struct simple. If you wanted to initialize it and your your function actually is using the same like keywords, the same variable names, you don't have to actually declare the attribute name. So I'll show you exactly what that means. If we explicitly say that we're going to get username and email as strings in our function. And then we want to go in and say, let user one equal user. Originally, what you saw was we did email and it would look like this, right? Like we would have username, username, and it honestly just looks kind of silly. So what you could really do is you could just do something like this. We'll just comment that out so you can see it still. All you have to do is just declare that you're passing those in. And because they have the same name, it, you don't have to worry about this like declarative kind of representation. Rust knows. It knows that it's called username and it implicitly is going to know to put it on either the username or the email attribute based on the name. So super cool. And then the other ones we don't have part of our like function header. So we're just going to pass those in normal. But that's pretty interesting. So, you know, like I said, when params have the same name, you could just pass them. Add that comment for you guys on GitHub. Um, now, that's how you initialize a struct. So what about like updating the values in a struct? Well, let's cover that then. So let's go with a function update struct. And I'm just going to copy this up here again. So we're going to make user one equal to this again. And what you could actually do is if you wanted to update something, we have to first make this mutable. And then you're going to want to say user one dot email and let's change it to string from someone 
new at example.com. So that's how you go ahead and change an attribute of an existing object that's represented by a struct. Now you can also do something pretty neat, which is related. You can actually inherit the rest of the values from one user. And what does that really mean? Well, it's probably easiest to just write the code and then talk about it. So if we want user two to be of the struct user, to be an object of type user, instead of typing in all of the attributes, if we want to inherit, let's say we want to inherit both of these values from user one, like we want to just like copy it. Instead of trying to set user two equal to user one and having to use references and things like that, what you can do is we're going to copy these over, but what you can do is let's say, let's say this is going to be some, you know, just different names here to represent. Let's take these out and actually we can do dot dot user one. And that's just going to say, okay, we declared these two attributes to be these, but then everything else that's part of this struct that is required to initialize, just copy it from user one. So that's pretty nice. Comes in handy and you know, you could definitely think of some use cases there. So what about methods? If you guys are familiar with classes, you obviously know about methods. So let's talk about how those work. Um, I'm gonna use the rest of this page here for this, so I'm gonna space this out a little bit. But let's introduce a new struct. We're gonna do person. And that person is gonna just have a first name of string and a last name of string. So it, in order to implement a method for this person struct, traditionally what you'd see in a lot of languages is like these these sort of curly braces are going to represent the scope and inside you would type like a function like let's say hello but rust is immediately going to say you can't do that so functions are not allowed in struct definitions instead what you have to do is define them separately using this impl keyword which is implement so we're going to implement person and we're going to define these methods down here. So this part's going to be really important. First, we're going to show what Rust recognizes as a method, and it's going to use this reference to itself. So if we just do like details, you have to pass at self in as a parameter. You can pass other parameters, but that one is required. If you're familiar with Python, this is also very similar to how Python works for methods. And let's just go with like a string from, and we're gonna actually reference one of the attributes of the struct itself. So self again, and we'll do last name. Cool, so you can see that the ID doesn't recognize any errors with that. So this is a method. Now, let's go ahead and create an example down here so we can see exactly what the importance of a method versus what's called an associated function, which we'll get to in a sec. So let's just create this example function. Whoops. And I'm going to say, let George equal person. And his first name is going to be string from George, obviously. And his last name is going to be string from Lopez. So we got George Lopez here. <clears throat> now we can do this function here and just print out the result of our details method and get George's name, right? Like we told it to return the last name. So this is going to print out Lopez. But what if we instead, let's say we write a new function up here and we want to say, I don't know, let's do like function more details. And we'll do the same thing. We'll just have it return a string. And let's say this time we're going to do, we're going to do George's, well, the struct's first name. Now, right off the bat, we're getting an error. Russ says self is a keyword only available in methods with a self parameter. 
So we didn't pass that self-reference in as a parameter. Therefore, this is not recognized as a method. This is instead recognized as what's called an associated function. And obviously, the difference being is that it does not use the self-reference. So what is an associated function? Well, an associated function, if you've ever programmed in Java, it's similar to a static method. Um, basically, this is it's an attribute of the module itself. It has nothing to do with the attribute values of struct of the struct that you created. It's instead just a function that is included in this structure. So like it come it helps really for like code organization and things like that. Like if you have the person object and then there's some methods that you can do different operations on the attributes, you might also have some functions that are just related to like a person object that you might want to just store in that particular Rust file, whatever you want to do. But to get rid of this error, we have to return something that doesn't have anything to do with the attributes. So I'm going to go back to my classic pizza example. And going off of what we just talked about, we obviously can't implement this in the same way that we did above. Namely, we can't just type this representation and then do George dot more details. Forgot my semicolon here. Because like we said, this is an associated function, not a method. And Russ is telling us the same thing. This has nothing to do with George. Like we just created George as a person and George is an object. But since this is an associated function that doesn't relate to the attributes, more commonly known as a static method in other languages, Instead, it's an attribute of the struct itself. So we're going to just do person. And here we have a syntax change. So now our error goes away. And this is super important to note. Double colons and the name of the struct for associated methods or associated functions. And then the name of the object you created with the struct and a period or dot to represent a method. So pretty interesting. That's really the gist of structs. And these are going to come in extremely handy, obviously, with object-oriented programming and with things like data type handling and, you know, maybe like REST API response bodies and stuff like that. There's going to be some really cool features you could do with structs.